Hello friends, <coughs> I'm waiting for Dr. Saurabh now to begin the lecture. So as he announces, I'll start. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm here. So a uh, very good welcome to everyone on the third day of our web lecture series, the international web lecture series or, organized by the Department of English, Kondathana Mahavidyalaya. And today we have a very distinguished guest. And I know that you have heard his name and uh, yes, his fame because he is uh, uh, so well known in the in the literary field. He is Dr. Anand Prakash, and today he is going to deliver a lecture on literature, modern and contemporary. Anand Prakash taught English literature in a college under Delhi University till retirement in 2007. He has written extensively on literary theory as well as interpreted texts and trends. He has published poems in English and Hindi. He supports the cause of writing committed to change. Authors of many books in English and Hindi, Anand Prakash has lectured on culture and ideology. Some of his published books include Northrop Literary Theory, Wuthering Heights, An Interpretation, Mukti Board in Our Time, Text and Performance, A Theoretical View, published by Macmillan. His edited volumes include Approaches to Literary Theory, Marxism, 19th Century Thought, Modern Indian Thought, Interventions, and Republicanism in uh, Shakespeare, etc. And this is for the students, especially students, students of fourth sem and sixth sem under Bangkok University, you know, that uh, a text was prescribed by the university for your studies. Uh, it's called Interventions. And that very text has been edited by Dr. Anand Prakash. So I welcome Dr. Anand Prakash heartily and invite him to deliver his lecture. Sir, please. Thank you, Mr. Nag, for this generous introduction. Welcome, sir. And yes, uh, as uh, you tell me, that there is a book that I edited and that is being used by your students. So I am further happy to interact with them through this lecture. Friends, uh, <clears throat> first I welcome you all. And I know that it's a uh, bright batch of uh, students, scholars, who will tomorrow be the builders of the academic world in our country. So uh, I'm also beholden to Dr. Nahal for organizing this lecture and uh, giving me the opportunity to interact with you. So uh, my lecture, as has been already announced, is titled uh, Literature, Modern and Contemporary. And uh, I chose this topic myself, um, uh, as asked by Dr. Nahal. And uh, I had uh, one or two things in mind while choosing this particular title. Uh, I have done some reading on literary theory, and I thought that these concepts of modern and contemporary uh, should be uh, clarified further. Uh, with your help, uh, you will be interacting with me. You can ask questions later. And these two words are central to the uh, subject of English literature as we study it uh, in India today. Uh, I'll start uh, by giving a general working definition of the three words that are there in the title. First is literature. What is literature? Since I'm talking to the students, so this is the topic uh, that always occurs to us uh, when we begin a particular thing. And uh, literature for me, as I understand it, is something that an imaginative person writes about himself and about the world in which he lives. And uh, since uh, in writing words are used, so these words are a kind of tool in his hands and he uses them in order to create an image, in order to give a description, in order to uh, you know form a view and share that with the audience. Audience does not come directly uh, in the picture as the writer writes. It is somewhere in the background because the writer is basically talking to himself. And uh, this particular activity of talking to oneself gives him a chance to become clear about his or her views. Uh, I may have some impressions about life and uh, I just carry them with me all the time. And they are expressed in my work, in my behavior. But when I decide to share it with the audience, then I become 
self aware i become conscious of my own thoughts because i am not sure whether all these things cross my mind when i face a kind of audience so just see that even though i am talking to myself even though i am making uh, you know a particular formulation to to become clear myself i know that at the background somewhere is the audience is the person who is listening to me and uh, therefore literature is double edged it is talking to oneself and it is not talking to somebody else let me also clarify in the beginning itself that the writer actually is one of the audience the writer has a kind of relationship with the audience uh, the writer uh, knows a particular language the writer is exposed to certain influences in life and particularly coming from culture and that's what all the others also do therefore when the writer is talking to himself talking about the world that he has seen in fact he is talking to other people because he is just like them he shares his thoughts his prejudices his likes and dislikes with other people so the writer is not an individual in that sense the writer actually is a kind of type is is a kind of representative of the people with whom he interacts so this is the first thing uh, it's a working definition uh, i use words as a writer then i uh, try to uh, communicate uh, with people my own uh, understanding my own states of mind my own feelings and emotions and that's what writing is when you come to modern then the problem occurs what is modern uh, you know that uh, the word modern uh, would be applicable to all the times whenever a writer wrote for instance christopher marlow wrote in the 16th century and uh, when he wrote then he was talking about certain things that he saw and uh, since he saw them therefore all of them belong to the 16th century so at that time that was modern but if that is the case then why should we use this term today because today's modern is not the modern of that time now this is the problem that i face all the time as i explain this to the students my understanding is that modern also represents a kind of perspective perspective on life an angle on life a position on life so when marlowe writes or shakespeare writes then he is writing not merely about his time he also is expressing an attitude i hope you understand what i mean uh, an attitude is modern and uh, the modern attitude wasn't there in the let's say 15th century or 14th or 13th century in england it somehow appeared in the 16th century why that is because earlier people thought that there was a kind of reality that was outside themselves there was outside the world in fact and if that was the case then that would be all the eternal and there will there will be nothing old or nothing new nothing modern and nothing less modern or unmodern so modernity appears as a concept only in the 16th century let's say in the 15th and 14th centuries also to, to an extent but then it is basically about the time and the attitude is that what you see is real now it, it all appears simple uh, to us that what we see is real but it didn't appear like that to people in the 13th century for instance we always thought that they were seeing not reality they were seeing an illusion to go to the philosophy books to go to people writing at that time and they would always have a kind of moral principle that they are addressing and uh, they are not talking about the world they are talking about people you know uh, who have some kind of a faith in religion some kind of a faith in god so they are talking about god and god is eternal god doesn't change so there's nothing about modern god and the ancient god to those people at that time so modern becomes relevant in the 16th century or little before that why so this is the question that i ask myself and this is the question that you should be asking yourself also how come that in europe and particularly in england people start using the term now people start using the present and uh, you know when you come to uh, uh, marlowe shakespeare bacon and others then you know that they are talking to the actual people so when you start communicating with actual people then the word modern occurs because people have been already uh, born and 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 they already died and the others you know came on come to the scene and there is a kind of series that is going on so somebody was there yesterday somebody is there today and somebody will be there tomorrow so this kind of time where you live in the present uh makes you aware about it only around that time uh i, I hope you you would have known by now 
that I'm talking about Renaissance. So uh, when Renaissance occurs, then people become aware of themselves. Then they start, start taking what they see as real. And this is a big leap from the earlier world. So in a way, Renaissance is that point where people stop being medieval in their ideas. They, 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 being, they, they, they stop being medieval about the, the norms of life, about morality, about religious principles, about the states of faith. And then they say, now there's a whole world before us, and this world constitutes human beings, and these human beings are real human beings. They are not once or twice removed from reality. They, they, they are there, and if you have certain ideas, then those ideas emanate from these actual living human beings in flesh and blood. So what I say is that this is what is modern, and that when the word term modern is used, then you have a sense of the past. If you have an idea of the eternal, the unchanging, or uh, transcendental, for instance, they don't bother about the past. They have nothing like the past. There is nothing like the present. But if you believe in the present, if you believe in the actual, then you have a history. And uh, modernism has a history. What that history is, uh, is outside the purview of my discussion today. But then definitely, Shakespeare all, all the time has a particular span, a, a particular point in time. Uh, you know, uh, he's, he's, the, he's the first one, one of the first ones uh, you know, in the 16th century who uses the, the word history extensively. Even when he's writing uh, a play that is not historical, then he would say, history of Hamlet. Now tell me why Shakespeare called the, the play Hamlet, which has no direct connection with the, with the reality of his time or some other time, history of Hamlet. And then of course, he's known for writing those history plays. And in those history plays, there is a sequence. Sequence like first, second, and third. So when you read the display, uh, you know, uh, uh, Henry IV, then it's part one. If there's a part one, then you, you are aware that there will be a part two. Then there's the Henry VI, uh, 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 one, two, and three. So these things suggest, you know, that the person is talking about the modern. He's talking about the last king that, 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 that he will speak of, and that all others will be placed before him. So this idea of the modern actually occurs at that time. So it occurs at a time when your sense becomes, my sense becomes historical. I know that there was a past, that past influenced me, that past produced me, and that I'm contributing to its growth further through my behavior at the present time. I hope there is some, some kind of uh, your understanding of this now, that this is what modern is. Now, why is Shakespeare, for instance, called a modern writer? Uh, you know, we are very suspicious about the use of words uh, when we particularly you know, pay and comments where when we talk, talk of talk, talk praising, you know, a certain author. So there are certain people in the 20th century who would say that they are modern, and if Shakespeare at all is modern, he's early modern. Anyway, the, 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 the saving grace is that they are calling him early modern, which means that they will be later moderns. And uh, that the, the, yeah, the meaning of the word modern will change in the 20th century. It's not the same word as, 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 as it is in the 16th century or in the 17th century. Now think, for instance, of a particular theme that is biblical, that talks about the eternal, that talks about God, that talks about Satan, that talk about all the people you know who are always there and they're outside time. And the, the gentleman who is writing about them is Milton. Now think of Paralyzed Lost from this angle, from the angle of modernity. Is Paralyzed Lost a modern poem or just a poem like the Bible, just like it, uh, an account like the Bible or other religious books? Ask this question from yourself. My answer to this question is that when Milton thinks of writing Paralyzed Lost, he knows that he's talking about the 17th century. He is quite close to Puritanism. Uh, not that uh, he, in his behavior, in his views, he will be an entirely Puritan person. But then uh, he, sp he speaks from that position, the, the position of the Puritan. But then he's also a writer. And a writer cannot, can be anything but Puritan. The writer goes into all the aspects of life, moral, immoral, amoral, historical, non-historical, whatever, because it is, it is in, in, in the purview of the writer. And uh, when Paralyzed Lost is written, it's written about the 17th century. How does the 17th century look at the question of God? And uh, here is the revolutionary aspect of Milton's poetry, that when he writes Paralyzed Lost, then he God, makes God a character. Uh, it's very difficult to conceive of God as a, as a character, you know, but, but he's uh, using him as a character. And if there is a character called God, then this God will also speak. Now, what does God think? 
that will be manifest in his in his speaking and uh, god is given speeches in paradise lost and he talks to his son now is the son of god the same as god himself is the question that we can ask and uh, uh, written that way is uh, really rattling the audience by telling that there are two people one character is god and the other character is the son of god and these two characters actually differ with each other god says one thing the son says another god says be stern or uh, be disciplined in life and son says let's also be compassionate and god agrees with the son now just say there are two characters and in the 17th century uh, god has the eternal being the, the, the source of all 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 life on the earth and in the entire cosmos god is a character god speaks in in in, 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 in his, in his uh, poem and there he expresses the point of view what is god's point of view it will be good to answer this question for your own self what is the son's point of view to the son of god that there will be another good question that you have to answer as to these people having points of view but the most revolutionary thing about this particular text is that here adam and eve also are given a chance to be characters and they are as big characters as god so what is milton doing milton is presenting adam and eve as people who are his children and and who talk to him sometimes and and who also hear his words and uh, you know the, the, their views are different and uh, adam talking to himself talking to his uh, mate uh, the the uh, the eve uh, of the play or uh, eve of the uh, you know a poem that they also have different points of view and there are restrictions there and in fact uh, when i read uh, paradise lost i see a kind of patriarch uh, in in in, in, in god and i see a kind of friend in 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 the son of god and i see real pals in the form of adam and eve and it sets a modern text and uh, milton is so very disturbing uh, in in his view of uh, presenting a kind of point of view to to his characters that uh, the uh, conservatives never liked him uh, you know for instance uh, dr johnson in the 18th century would not like milton Uh, for for this reason, that he is talking in, in in terms of rationality, and that in the rational debate you can differ, you can be wrong or right, but then this is what happens. And uh, see that uh, there is a question regarding uh, this particular text that uh, in, in Paradise Lost, uh, very soon you will have a fight. You you will have Adam, you know, uh, flouting the wishes, uh, Eve flouting the wishes of God. And, and 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 going against the discipline that God imposes, and that then in fact they turn human beings. Earlier they were not human beings; they they were just there in the Garden of Eden, and they were mo- moving around, and they were presenting a point of view, and they were we- uh, you know uh, observing certain values, and uh, they would have eternally remained there uh, away from the tree of knowledge, but definitely in the Garden of Eden. But no, uh, they they make mistakes. and that mistake now uh, you know uh, brings about the downfall they are thrown out rather angrily by god but but, but quite uh, uh, with the understanding why why by some of god and and they fall on the earth so that the fall of man is moment and when they are here then they will go back to godliness to god god's abode but the space between the earth and heaven that's the space that that they occupy and that is the human space So I'll just see that uh, uh, earlier there was one kind of a god, and in the 17th century there is another kind of god, and later on a debate begins. The debate is carried on about god, about uh, human beings, you know, uh, uh, emotions, their longings, their urges, all these things in the 18th century and 19th century by the Romantics. Now, why I raised the question of modernity in, in this particular discussion was that there are people in the 20th century. Who don't like either Milton uh, for, for for their reason or or the Romantics? Uh, do you know who I'm who I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of T.S. Eliot. He dislikes both, and he says that in the 17th century, some kind of a gap, some kind of a some kind of a distance occurs, you know, in the sensibility of the people. He calls it dissociation of sensibility. That you know, you uh, if you feel you can't think, if you think you can't feel, and there is a big gap between thinking and feeling. Why is he? Why is he doing so? Because R. T. S. Eliot, by saying this, that the dissociation of sensibility, uh, sensibility in the 17th century, what he is saying is that human beings have 
turned away from the, the influences of the, 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 the transcendent and that they, they can't get back to it and that has caused a kind of dissociation. Indirectly, T.S. Eliot is critiquing both Shakespeare and Milton. And I've taken these examples there, examples of modernity. And T.S. Eliot would like to be called a modern. So he will have to redefine his modernity in a different manner. In fact, uh, uh, T.S. Eliot is entirely against the idea of Renaissance. He thinks that the world was much better before the Renaissance than it was the medieval period. And therefore, you know, he didn't like the blank words and he went back. I, I don't want to go into that discussion, but I say that modernity has been the central concept of our understanding post Renaissance in, in the last 600, 700 years. And I thought that I, I should share this with you. The second point I make is about uh, contemporaneity or contemporary. The same word as TLS is used. What is contemporary? Uh, please try to understand. And you will know that uh, contemporary is not modern. It is strange that con actually contemporary, uh, all people uh, had a kind of contemporary existence uh, of other people. Uh, the the uh, author that I talked about, uh, they had their contemporary, they had also contemporary conditions, but then they were called modern. Why is it that the word contemporary occurs in the modern critical thought and in the 20th century thought? This is a question, I'm not answering this question directly. But definitely, you have to keep in mind that there is a gap between the modern and the contemporary. Now, my view is, uh, I'm just, just giving my view, but not definitely a, uh, an answer. My view is that contemporary cuts off from the history of, 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 of human experience, of human existence. And that contemporary simply means of today. So tomorrow it won't be contemporary, so tomorrow will be different from today. So that kind of contemporary actually will make it apolitical, will make it irrelevant in terms of wrong or right. And that contemporary is what is. Now, just see, they are borrowing the, the uh, people who believe in contemporaryness. They, they, they are, uh, you know, uh, they uh, are borrowing ideas from vocabulary from modernity, but then they are saying something else. Present is fine, but present assumes that there is a past. Present also assumes that there is a future. Now, uh, if you, if you uh, have seen or uh, read, uh, uh, discussed four quartets, then these are the, the, the first lines of uh, the four quartets, that past is present and present is future and future is contained in time past. This is what T.S. Eliot says. So in a way, the difference between the past, present and future, that is slurred over. And that is supposed to be a kind of continuum. And this is, and uh, T.S. Eliot is a modernist. So, when you think of modernism as a kind of ism, as a kind of system of ideas, then it becomes different from what we understand by modern and contemporary. So for me, contemporary is a historical. In fact, it is a conscious attempt by believers in uh, the, the contemporary life or what uh, T.S. Eliot would call contemporary nighty, is that contemporary is cut off from the past. This is totally different and this is the 20th century. And uh, Eliot also is no more. He died sometime in the 60s. And after that, you know, uh, uh, other people came. So who is contemporary then? Uh, 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 yes, Eliot would not be contemporary except in the term of the, uh, in, 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 in the terms of the uh, eternal. So he'll be there, but then he is not contemporary at all. So contemporary is a political category. So uh, I, I use these three words now to explain the idea of modern, contemporary, and literature. And uh, we have to look at it from uh, the angle of uh, being Indians, being, being uh, from the angle of being Indian students, uh, people who are aware, who are aware of inequity, who are aware of injustices in society, uh, aware of uh, inequality, uh, uh, aware of the problems and uh, tragic or destructive tendency that are, are going around with us, and that we have to look at it from a different angle. So I'm touching upon now the idea that, 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 that is closer to us, uh, to Indians, the Indian scholars, the Indian students, and I would like them to look at this problem of uh, literature being modern or contemporary from our angle. What is our angle? Uh, I always you know, uh, talk to young scholars, uh, telling them, reminding them again and again that they belong to an ex-colony. All of us belong to an ex-colony. Till 1947, we were the slaves of. We were the subjects of uh, the, 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 the British regime. They were superior, we were inferior. They had one color, we have another color. 
they, they had enlightenment, they had modernity, they had advanced views, they had scientific thought, they had industrialism. We had nothing of the sort. So you are inferior beings. And uh, well, uh, uh, this may be to an extent true that we were devoid of the scientific knowledge, scientific temper, that's fine. But that as human beings, we are equipped not to uh, become scientific, uh, to, to become modern is something uh, is that, uh, that, that can be a kind of curse. And uh, we know that uh, if we try uh, or, or, you know, some, some, uh, somehow in the 19th century to study science, to, to, to look at the cosmos from another angle, to go back to our history and the history of Europe and to see that there was a connection, then that was possible. So we were slaves, but as slaves, we also were angry. We also had our problems and we knew that we had to fight for, uh, you know, uh, and getting a solution to our problems ourselves. So never forget, and if, if we forget, that, that then we will be cut off from life, uh, you know, our patterns ourselves. Then never forget that we are, we will live in an ex colony and that we somehow share the prejudices of the whites in our midst, uh, they were there till the 1947. So think about this idea that we are. Uh, we are ex. Uh, we, we live in ex colony, and that we have to look at the whole literature from our own angle. Now, in the 19th century, there was a movement. All of you know, you are mostly from Bengal. You know that there was a uh, movement called Young Bengal, and they were there in the early part of the 19th century, and uh, they they were teachers and, and and they discussed things, and they had a kind of scientific temper, and they were driven by social reform. Social reform means the society of the old kind is not bearable. It, 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 it should not be accepted. And uh, they, they fought for it. Uh, and the biggest you know, source of inspiration for the 19th century India uh, from, from, the, from the angle of English literature came from the Romantics. Strange that Romantics and Milton and Rawl, these people will be, uh, you know, they are uh, quite relevant uh, at that time. And uh, in, in the 20th century, there will be others in England uh, who would be criticizing uh, you know, uh, the, the Romantics, Milton and Shakespeare, but Indians liked Romantics. Uh, I, I hope you know that uh, uh, in the 19th century, a large number of poets were, were uh, influenced by the, the Romantic idea, the Romantic thoughts. The young Bengal people were all Romantics in their own way. Uh, Tagore was a kind of a Romantic. Tagore was a mystic, mystical, uh, you know, uh, he had a mystical understanding. So, but, but he was also Romantic, Romantic in the best sense of the world. He believed in imagination. He, he believed in sympathy for the human being, which romantics all had. And uh, the, the last point I make, and there, there I'll finish and I'll take questions. The last point is that romanticism is wrongly defined as uh, something, you know, that is not connected to the reality. Nothing could be, you know, further from the truth. Romantics are deeply, uh, you know, engaged with the problems of the time when they lived. The, uh, uh, I can, you, you can differ with me, but the kind of destruction, the kind of violence, the kind of devastation that the period of romanticism faced uh, is, is, is not there in the, in the earlier century or not there uh, till quite some time later. Uh, you know that uh, uh, in England in the early 19th century, uh, there were constant wars between uh, one nation and another. And uh, uh, in War and Peace, uh, Tolstoy talks about it. He talks about you know, Napoleonic wars and the kind of bloodshed that was there. And this is the exactly romantic period. Uh, think of, uh, you know, uh, the slave trade in England in the early, early 19th century. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all right to you just use the word slave trade. But imagine what slave trade means. It means that people are actually captured from the forest or from the villages. Uh, uh, they, they, are, they are, dragged, are dragged out from the hutments and they are put into the ships from Africa and uh, when they are for initially they, they, they might revolt but then they will be tortured and you know what's the state of torture of the, of the slaves who will be brought to uh, you know America and England in, in, at that point of time and then they will be made to work on the fields. You can't imagine the kind of torture for the first 15-20 days they will be kept hungry and when they are completely you know, gone physically they can't even stand up then they are beaten up and then finally they are brought to their respective places where they will be sold and sold how? The, uh, the, the, the buyers of the slaves would, uh, you know, uh, dig their 
uh, arms, with their, with their thighs, with their backs, with sticks to find out how much of muscle is there or is it all fat. And if there is muscle, then they can work better. Now, this is the kind of slave trade that is going on in the, in the time of romanticism. Do you think, uh, can I think that uh, romantics would not be aware of this? They were aware, aware of this. And many of the romantics at that point of time turned socialists. Uh, I can think of Shelley, I can think even of Byron. Byron, even when uh, you know, the, the, well, England was locked in a war with France, Byron uh, and, and France lost and, and England won, then Byron uh, on that particular day, uh, when you know uh, Napoleon lost the battle, on that particular day he came to the parliament, he was a member of the House of Lords and uh, Byron wore black clothes. He said, I'm in a state of mourning because those people, heroic people have lost and our traders, English traders have won. So see the sympathy of the romantics in, 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 in the Rally country because of which these people became a kind of a great influence for the Indian poets and writers. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm uh, aware of the uh, romantic movement in Bengal, but I'm a little more aware about it in Hindi writing. In Hindi writing, there's a whole trend. Uh, it, it runs for about 30 years, and the trend is called Chayavad. And Chayavad is nothing but romanticism. And uh, the, the romantic poets, the Chayavadi poets in Hindi, uh, they, are, they are talking of nature, they are talking of inequality, they are talking of equality, there is a person like Yerala and all. So what I am saying is that uh, the study of literature must keep in mind the idea of history, the, the idea of modernity, the idea of contemporary as a part of that history. And that, that, that is the only way we can make sense of literature in a particular manner and particularly as we are citizens of an ex-colony called India. So I, I, I stop here temporarily and if there are questions, I'd be glad to uh, interact with you and I would like to know your views on this. So uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks to all of you and uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Nag also that he gave me this opportunity and uh, I'm sure that there will be some sense in what I said. Thank you. Uh, sir, we're really indebted to you uh, for your kindness and the uh, engaging lecture that you just delivered. Now the floor is open for the audience and I would like to request the audience to ask questions if you have any or if you have any suggestion or comment to add on. So uh, if you have any question you can unmute yourself, ask the question and then mute yourself and then wait for the answer. Uh, do you have any question? Um, yes, Dr. Nag, I have a question for Dr. Prakash. I'm no good here. Please. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for a wonderful lecture, Dr. Prakash. Um, I uh, was particularly interested in this uh, comment that you made when you were discussing about literature. Uh, and you uh, mentioned what exactly is a writer. And you said that writer, a writer is not an individual, but he is a type. So uh, this is a very uh, uh, intriguing uh, uh, phrase, so to say, that he is not an individual, but he is a type. So could you please uh, help us understand this a bit more, that what do we mean by the type? The first thing, uh, uh, it's a good question, right? because you know, uh, this, this is a kind of paradox, uh, where you use a language which you think is your language. I think it's my language, these are my words, but I know that language has, has, has its own community. And then all of us, you know, share a particular meaning there. So language connects us. So, so even when one is individually talking, even then one is talking about society as a whole. I am a citizen. I observe certain norms. Uh, I am a democrat. And if I am a democrat, then I give other, uh, other people a chance to interact with me. I also learn from them. And even if I don't learn, then I criticize them. So in either case, whether I accept or reject, agree or disagree, I am part of a community. So I am using a community medium. Uh, I, I am a human being, I, I uh, share all the human traits with other people and even the opinions that I uh, express as individual opinions are in fact opinions of a whole section of society. Uh, these opinions are not uh, entirely uh, you know, uh, in, in my kitty. I, I, I don't produce them just there as if you know, uh, uh, every person you know, has only individual opinion. I believe that all opinions belong to and emanate from certain experiences which are social experiences. So that way, uh, I believe, um, uh, maybe I'm wrong, I believe that whatever I say to words actually uh, gets into the pattern of the existing uh, you know, uh, world of words and that there it becomes a kind of type. 
I, I, I hope I'm, I'm making some sense. Am I clear? Yes, definitely, sir. That uh, for sure clear, uh, clarifies the point. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to ask any question? Okay, uh, sir. I uh, I have one question, uh, sir. Uh, when you were concluding your lecture, you mentioned the turbulent time in the 19th century, uh, both in England and in France. And we all of us know that uh, yes, uh, the English people had a very uh, turbulent time during the 19th century, and uh, the people who were writing before the Romantics, they they did not suffer so much as the Romantics did. But you know that Romantic literature speaks about the Arcadian world, speaks about uh, innocence and uh, closer proximity to nature. So uh, can we or should we consider Romanticism um, uh, uh, a key to a key to our happiness, a kind of escape into the world of uh, that kind of Arcadian bliss? Is Romanticism? Uh, a solution to the disturbed times that the romantics were also facing. So, what is your observation regarding this? You see, uh, I've, been always, I've been always taught to uh, think like this. Uh, uh, my, my teachers always told me that this was romanticism. But uh, there was a kind of confusion in my mind. For instance, uh, when the French Revolution occurs, then romantics, uh, I, I thought, were looking at nature. And then they wanted to go back to uh, the time, you know, when everybody was innocent and equal and everybody was happy. And there was a kind of bliss. But the very fact that one had to go away from the present time was a comment on the present time. And, uh, you know, many romantics, I gave some examples, uh, they, they became uh, late on uh, great critics of the society of the time. And uh, they, they start and... Uh, the, the other question that, uh, not me, but others have to answer, you also have to answer perhaps, that uh, there is a way in which the Indian mind at that time uh, reacts in a, in, a, in a very favorable sort of a way, positive way to romanticism. And that most of the romantics of the 90s, young Bengal particularly, they, they become very good social critics. They, 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 they talk about the conditions of the poor uh, in India at that time, which the traditionalists, the dogmatists, don't talk about at all. So it's a very strange thing, and I think we should think more about it, that Romanticism appealed to those who were deprived in the colonies. And, and the colonial people thought, you know, that uh, we, uh, we have to, uh, you know, see freedom uh, in the light of what Romanticism uh, projected. So it's a very difficult question to answer at the moment, because uh, these, these things crop up. Tagore is not a very very peaceful person with oneself. He's a mystic, no doubt. But at the same time, he's deeply pained by the inequalities, by, by the kind of atrocities that, 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 that are being committed by, by, the, by the male community uh, on, on the females of the time, women of the time. He's so very sympathetic to women in the 19th century. She is uh, short stories, she, she is uh, novels, uh, particularly called Gora Pahari. Uh, think about that. There's a woman who has been always imprisoned in the four walls of the house, and she wants to now get free. I think this idea of the freedom of Gora Pahari it is written in the early 20th century, uh, is because there's a kind of romanticism at the back of it. People want to get away from home. Home is where tragedy is. Outside world is free. So all these things, you know, uh, give a new perspective to uh, the question that uh, you and I are discussing. So I agree with you that uh, this view has been there, but this has been consistently now critiqued by, by, by modern scholars. And the thing that romanticism actually is the expression of anguish of the people who are facing tragic circumstances. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Okay, Nath, can I come in? Uh, of yeah. course, of course. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, Payal Nathpal uh, from Delhi University. I want to ask Dr. Prakash something. Uh, so you, uh, first of all, sir, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. And I wanted to ask you, you spoke about modernity. You spoke about the writer today, the writer being a type. Uh, who are the writers, uh, you know, in, uh, at the, in the present world that you would appreciate and you would associate them with the spirit of modernity? Well, lots of them. <clears throat> For instance, uh, Tagore is one example. Uh, then there will be Shobraman Bharti, like a kind of, uh, you know, spokesperson for, for, for modernity and, and for freedom. Then there will be uh, Atiyah Hussain, 
that there will be Ishma Chuktai, uh, there will be Kamala Markande, there will be Kamala Das. All of them talk about freedom. They are all critics of patriarchy. And uh, if Indian student, Indian scholar has to get inspiration from, then these are the writers. So most of them are women. There are some idealist men also. Uh, one of the best examples in, 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 in contemporary uh, writing in India would be that of Mukti Bodh and Prenchan. Prenchan became a, a proper critic of uh, imperialism in his own time. In fact, he start, he's, he's one of the rare ones in India who is talking about Bolshevism. He died in 1936, but uh, in, in his last years, he was he was uh, uh, looking at the world from the angle of a uh, Bolshevik dream. He said that that is the kind of equality we want. He used it so in, 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 in so many words. Then the, the, there are uh, people like Kamala Markandi who writes a novel about the present person in, in, in the 50s. And if somebody is taking up the present person, then that person is a direct descendant of Benjamin who talks about the present person. The contemporary uh, writing uh, in India, particularly in the 1970s and 80s, poses this problem. These people uh, you know, uh, selectively talk about issues of life. Uh, I, 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 I uh, thought about it while uh, preparing for this uh, kind of perspective for this lecture. And I, and I believe that uh, the writing in the 1980s and 90s is taking up special subjects as if they were different from the other subjects, like diaspora. So we talk about diaspora, which means that you have to do research on this. Uh, some other people will talk about feminism, so they'll talk about feminism alone, without realizing that uh, the, the two, two things or many things cannot be separated from one another. Some people talk about ecology, so they'll do research there. So you spend time in the library for two or three years and then write a novel. And then sell that novel, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know the kind of money that, 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 that literature uh, sometimes makes uh, in the hands of successful authors. So uh, that kind of problem is there. And, and I believe that uh, this is because contemporary thought has done a kind of damage to uh, literature in India uh, in the period that we are discussing. Uh, contemporary writing has to be a part of modernity. And modernity has to be different from uh, what is called modernism. So these, these questions are intertwined and, and, and one has to think about them. One, there's no, no, no uh, you know, uh, uh, easy way to do to, to an answer. But definitely, we can problematize and say that India, as a, as, as, as a land of writers, is facing lots of issues. They're grappling with things. Maybe someday the cobwebs will be cleared and they can see a reality in its, in, in its naked form. But till that time, the struggle is the word. That is the, 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 that's the key to, to the question that we are facing. Um, I have a question, if possible. Okay, please go go ahead. Uh, hello. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, hello, sir. I'm Abhavka. Good afternoon. Uh, and can I, am I audible? Can I put yes. my question? Yes, you are. Yeah. So it was so wonderful to hear your lecture. And uh, I had just one thing in my mind. Uh, does the contemporary uh, women writer have lost their, uh, you know, that kind of a zeal or that strong kind of a feminist vibe that could bring some so much changes in the society uh, as far as the writings of Sashi Deshpande or Kamla Markande we take in consideration uh, do you think their their kind of feminism is a mild one which is not to, enough to bring out the major changes in the society because they have lost what once was there in the writing of Kamala Das uh, I just wanted to know your opinion on this Okay. Actually, uh, actually uh, I, I favor feminism so of, of all kinds, even if the feminism is weak. And, okay. and, and, the, reason okay. is, and the reason is that uh, the kind of feminist writing that we have is an expression of honesty. So we have not allowed our women to, to have exposure to the world outside. Most of them, you know, are yes. outside the homes after the evening. So how can they understand all those things the way we want them to understand? So I believe that. Uh, Women writers are working very hard to understand the situation in which they live. And if they somehow fail somewhere, if they are weak somewhere, that is because of the patriarchal question that we are all, all praise for the contemporary women writers, and uh, they are taking courage in both of them. They, they are fighting their own battles inside the home, outside mm -hmm. the home, the street, and, 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 and they will definitely 
come up as citizens of tomorrow in the sense in which they inspire to be able to do okay thank you sir thank you so much um uh, sir i have a question this is urvashi from uh, delhi university and uh, sir you talked about shashi deshpande uh, you talked about kamla das so my question is that did these women writers face a lot of resistance in terms of the issues they took up because these were not they were not writing just about you know a daily uh, you know regular uh, routine in the, in their lives but they were you know picking up issues let's say uh, you know marital rape or or domestic abuse and so on and so in that sense did they meet a lot of resistance this is my first question and sir the second part would be that and if they did uh, you know write were they able to inspire their fellow uh, writers or budding writers in the way that they wanted to definitely <coughs> the it's, it's a kind of a phase you know in women's writing that she they spawned for instance would be very critical of the family structure uh, in her short stories and novels and uh, this is something that you know uh, is, is confronting the women of today uh, there are shackles to the family there are shackles of matrimony that there are shackles of norms and uh, uh, traditions there and women have to fight that and fighting that is not merely fighting women's battles but right. the, but the battles of society as a whole so i i see a lot of uh, hope a lot of possibility potentiality in women's writing and uh, their voice is genuine writing of uh, women particularly is marked by their genuineness which may not be there in the writings of males who are mostly uh, you know concerned about Uh, winning prizes and moving around and flaunting their view and all those things, but when women, they write with a sense of pain, and that is what impresses us. So, not much resistance to their writings, then. It should not be there. That they should be appreciated for what they do, even in the constrained circumstances, because women have to bear a front for of, of, of all these things in neighborhood, in outside, at the workplace that they are, they are targeted in the family. Absolutely, yes. In, in academia, the, the, the kind of injustice is done to them when it comes to appointments and all those things. And uh, see the conditions that they are worsening in that way. And uh, women, I'm sure, will not uh, uh, take it lying down. There will be a time when uh, literature is going to be more intense uh, in, in its struggle, you know, for equality. Right. So, uh, I, I really appreciate their, 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 their you know, anger, their, their anguish. Their exactly. Very true, sir. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Ah, uh, is there anyone else who wants to ask any question in the audience? Ah, uh, I have a question. Am I okay? okay. Please, please go ahead. Please. Ah, uh, so I am Richard Bajaj from Delhi University. uh so you seem to uh, pitch the modern against the contemporary somehow in the lecture and suggest that the modern is desirable i mean the lecture is titled as literature modern and contemporary but it seems to see modern as desirable and contemporary as uh, uh, something which is dubious so uh, i'd like you to comment on uh, one uh, your statement that con uh, contemporary is a political category and that contemporary cuts us off from history these two statements if you could just throw light on and um, tell us why they are dubious why is it political you see actually the word modern it can problematic for the critics of uh, you know uh, socialism in the early 20th century because mo modern was something that was against the ancient modern was something that was against the, the, the medieval modern was against the dogmatic so they thought that one way of uh, separating modern from Uh, uh, from from uh, you know uh, socialism or uh, 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 fight against inequality, they 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 uh, uh, made a term called modernism, and they themselves became modernists, and uh, they started interpreting the word modern as if you know the individual was modern, as if the helplessness was modern, and then you know it became necessary, and it is necessary today to retrieve the word modern uh, from the vocabulary of these people, the modernists uh, who talk about the moment. Talk about the separation of yesterday from today, and uh, they, they they become wrongly uh, and uh, a wrong kind of existentialists. They talk about existence without realizing that existence means real life. So 
uh, you know, there's there a war of war, war, you know, for, uh, going on for capturing language and vocabulary. So it is necessary for us also then to point out the the merits, the weaknesses of contemporary. Contemporary, as such, as something that belongs to the last ten years and not more than that. That that is also very dubious, and we should retrieve that word also. Contemporary is a part of the the, 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 the longer chain of time uh, that, that that we have before us. So uh, we produced uh, the the contemporary yesterday. So yes, how can we separate today from yesterday? So the fight is not about today against yesterday or against tomorrow, and and that we have we have to be all the time confined to the present. The fight is against forces that were active yesterday, are more dubious today, and are going to be horrifying for the in future. So the uh, when you separate uh, the time from history, when you start discussing history in negative terms and uh, use contemporary against the modern, then it is time to rethink. And I say that uh, uh, modern and contemporary are not antithetical. Actually, one is the part of the other. Uh, but the, uh, the the contemporary is, let's say, 1980, 1990, uh, 2000s, uh, 2010s. But then uh, modern would be uh, well only the early 20th century, and that modern would be only the capitalist existence. But please do not forget that in India, when T. S. Eliot is a modern and he's talking of the, of the world as a wasteland, exactly at the same time there is a person called Pinchon. He doesn't talk about the world as a wasteland. He talks about the world as the world in which fight is being waged against all kinds of orthodoxy and against the injustice done to peasants. So the same people in the, in the, in the 20th century, uh, Pendleton is talking about the, the freedom of the peasant from the shackles of uh, that kind, of, that feudalism that existed, and T. S. Eliot is talking about the wasteland. So therefore, the the contemporary and uh, uh, the um, uh, modern have to be integrated into a kind of vision that. Fights together against the, the, the forces of oppression today, and uh, when you combine that with the you know with the world today, then uh, have, have we forgotten about Iraq wars, which were just 15, 20 years ago? We've forgotten completely. The contemporary now is the 2010s, and very soon will be 2020s. So dividing time in these segments that seems to be the hallmark of contemporaryness, and that the word came from originally it came from. Uh, uh, yes, we talk about contemporary and IT, such a big word, so impressive to, 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 to uh, you know, even, even pronounce. And uh, it's a kind of a strategy that is being built around words so that finally we are confined only uh, to, to a small space of experience and uh, separated from the larger historical experience. That's how I look at it. I, I wonder whether uh, this makes sense. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any question? Anyone else? Okay, I think uh, we should move ahead. And I would like to request Ashin Kumar Bethal, a faculty member in the Department of English, Ondatana Mahabhidhanaya, to host the second slot. Uh, hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Am I audible? Am I am I am I audible? Yes. Yes, audible. Good afternoon, everybody. Special thanks to eminent speaker Dr. Anand Prakash. His name is enough to understand himself. I welcome you all in this virtual platform. I would like to thank professors, scholars, faculty members from the various institutions in any in my, and uh, my dear students. I am Asun Gobetal, faculty members, Odatana Mohavid Dalai, and research scholar, LNMU University, Darbhanga Bihar. Now, heartily, I introduce to you Dr. Mohammed Sami Mondal, assistant professor, Department of English, Green University, Bangladesh. He teaches diverse courses on different periods of English literature. He is interested in research works both in literature and English language teaching. He wrote 20 research articles published in national and international journals. Besides, he has penned poetry, short stories, and translated several books. 
now he is going to address us today with his topic margin as a site of resistance a study on agun pakhi by hasan azizul haq now i hand over my mic to dr mohammad sami mondal to deliver his lectures thank you sir can you hear me please yes yes okay Uh, good afternoon everybody i'm really excited and extremely happy to meet you all and it is a great honor for me to share the same platform with dr anand prakash sir whom i have known for a long and i have learned a lot from his video lectures uh thank you so much sir i'm from bangladesh mohammad shamim mondol assistant professor department of english green university of bangladesh today i'm here to talk uh, to you on a topic titled margin as a site of resistance a study on agun pakhi by hasan azil haq thank you so much for inviting me as a speaker special thanks to dr shorup kumar nag assistant professor and head department of english Onda Thana Mahavidyalaya for his honest cooperation, and again, thank you, Ashim sir, for a wonderful introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I have uh, divided my lecture into three parts. The very first part will be an introductory, and I'll try to introduce my topic, my point of discussion today, uh, in a very short manner, so that you can get a picture. of what i'm going to do in next 30 years and i can assure you i will take just 30 30, uh, 30 minutes sorry uh, i'll just uh, uh, do uh, with you i'll talk to you in next 30 minutes and the second part is uh, the theoretical part i will concentrate on the theory i will take insight from and my theoretical part is uh, from bell hooks a uh, cultural critic from america and the final part will be the text analysis and the text is agun pakhi the text i have taken is agun pakhi by hasan azil haq which can be translated loosely as the firebird and hasan azil haq perhaps you may the all may you all may not know him he is uh, the most prominent short story writer of bangladesh and uh though he started his career long back with writing some minor novels later on he concentrated only writing on short stories and became the most prominent writer of bangladesh of short stories but when he crossed 60 uh, years of age then he thought that he need to concentrate on also writing novels and then he instantly decided to write seriously got the theme and that is of course the perdition of india but he was searching for a figure for an image to fit the purpose and he was not getting that finally he came to conclusion that his mother's face his mother's image personality is the most fitting uh, character which can narrate the story as well his father's figure also helped him but most importantly it was his own experience that made him write the story because he was uh born in india in bordwan west bengal in 1930 uh, 39 and after passing his entrance he migrated to the then east pakistan in 1954 so it it was his own experience that also helped him shape the novel because he directly experienced the uh, perdition uh and 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 he had also the experiences of uh, british rule now when this novel agun pakhi was published in 2006 it created a ripple among the scholars and the critics both of bangladesh and india and he was awarded with the prestigious awards like prathom alok puraskar from bangladesh as well uh she was also uh, uh uh awarded anand pushkar of 2008 from india 
what is the story about? The story of the novel is a linear story. It's the story of an unnamed female protagonist uh, who is telling the story of her life. But while she was talking about her life, she was not oblivious of the society. So the novel is a story of her life of the socio-political, cultural, uh, you know, condition, situations, history of that time. And, uh, you know, she, she was just narrating the story, but the, the spark of the story lies in the last part. Because she is, uh, you know, uh, she, she's a housewife and she was confined within the domestic space throughout her life. But when the final moment came, she flatly denied to migrate from her birthplace. It was husband, it was the children, it was the situation, nothing could compel her because it was her realization of the situation which made her and, and uh, of course uh, made her think and take the decision that no, it is not a right decision. The partition was not pertinent at all. And this realization instantly uh, reminds us of Kazi Nurul Islam's Bidruhi the Rebel, where we can find a type of realization. Ami turiya non de chute choli, eki unmad, ami unmad, ami shohusha amare chine chhi, amar khuliya giya chhe shabbad. Which can be translated as maddened with an intense joy, I rushed. One word, I am insane, I am insane. Suddenly I have come to know myself and all the false barriers have crumbled down. Now, this novel is generally considered as a masterpiece of partition of Bengal. But to me, perhaps the most important part of the novel is the power of resistance that the writer is trying to show, which arises from the margin. And the narrator of this novel is a female protagonist who is multiply marginalized, but still, she comes out as a voice who can defy the established narratives and the discourses. This is the book, this is the realization of the protagonist, and I will focus on these factors in later analysis of the text. And for my theoretical perspective, I will go for bell hooks and uh, uh, one of her essays prefaced to fem uh, feminist theory from margin to center for analyzing the text. And Bell Hooks is a cultural critic of America. She's a feminist, social activist, uh, an intellectual, and among all his intellectuals, I will just concentrate on only one essay. And in that essay, she is just exploring the counter hegemonic you know, power of the margin. She is trying to show how a margin is the site for unbound breeding of resistance. What is the goal of my paper? The goal of my paper is to contest, uh, contest the long standing discourse of margin. Because generally we consider margin as a sequestered site a site of deprivation, site of oppression, site of suppression, without any potences, without any potentials. But I want to advance the argument that margin is an empowering site. A margin is the site of resistance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's have a look at the insights of our uh, Bell Hooks thoughts. Bell Hooks is uh, you know, aware of the fact that margin is generally considered as part of the whole, but is kept outside the main body. So the marginalized people cannot be in the center. They can enter there, but they cannot live there. They have to return to the margin just after serving in the center. So what happens? Because of this shuttling, from the margin to center, the marginalized, the marginalized people can have their attention 
on the center as well as the margin. So they can observe the existence of the whole universe, a ma the main body, which is the you know which is made up of the margin and the center. Because of this, you know, advantage of the marginalist people, you know, they are also always, you know, uh, made conscious of the perpetuated separation between center and the margin. And they always feel that, yes, they are in a struggle or against those oppositional forces. Because of that, they get a type of a sense of fullness, a sense of seeing, which the people in the center can never see. So what the marginal people can see, the people in the center can never see. The oppressors, it is uh, this view, this consciousness is totally unknown to the most of our oppressors. Because of that consciousness on the part of the marginalized people, the struggle comes to transcend poverty and despair. And this strengthens their sense of self and solidarity. So marginalization is not something to diminish, rather it is something to strengthen one's sense of self and sense of solidarity. And again, to bell hooks, margin is a site of immense potentials. It energizes, it empowers, and it creates a counter hegemonic discourse, not only in activities, but also in terms of words. One thing, bell hooks is you know, aware that generally, Mudzin is considered accepted as a site for losing, for giving up, for surrendering. If the margin is taken for granted as a site of this type of you know, attitude, this, this kind of situations, then it is bound to create despair, it is bound to create nihilism, and it is bound to create a space of collective despair. Once this is done, you know, the, those type of margin puts one's imagination at risk and makes one's mind colonized and the freedom of expression is burned. So the, the people in the margin must be aware of these facts about the margin. Then again, uh, bell hooks always feel that margin is an uh, a space of radical openness and possibility. It is a space where one must stay in, clings to, because it nourishes one's capacity. It opens up the possibility of radical perspective. And because of that radical perspective, the people in the margin can create and imagine alternatives, new worlds. And this is done through ongoing awareness of the necessity of opposition. And this also creates in them a type of space of refusal. They can say, to, say no to their oppressors, to the people, no to the people in the center. In this way, they come to a voice. And this is the voice of resistance because they already get a counter language. But it is important when the people in the margin get a type of voice, they must understand that what is not important in voice. It is also important, but more important is how and why. If the voice is there with how and why, they can showcase their lived experiences and they can, they can fill in the space of absence of voicelessness. Once they can get this kind of voice, they will you know, be in the margin, which will be a site of creativity and power. So the margin, once the voice is there, the margin is bound to be a site of creativity and power. Once it is done, the people in the margin can recover their lost self, advance their solidarity, and it is the bipolarity and can emerge as liberators. 
and the people on the margin must not be ashamed of their position in the margin at the same time they must be aware of the two sets of margin one is the imposed by the oppressors the oppressive structures and there is the chosen site of resistance and when the people in the margin are conscious of these factors you know this consciousness keep them alive the people in the uh, uh, margin they they are alive at heart they come to know the reality and this can affirm the primacy of resistance and of course they can understand the importance of the remembrance of the past and all this energize their radical perspective and decolonize their mind but one thing they must understand that this awareness this facing the oppositional forces this voicing their position will require a struggle and a struggle is always there for uh, their along with sufferings but if they have that conscience then this struggle also can get them pleasure delights and despair uh, desires once this is done they can get transformed individually and collectively affirm their position and sustain their subjectivity and in that position they will give a new location from which to articulate their sense of the world but we must remember that you know this space in the margin can be real as well as it can be imaginary it can be imagined i quote from bell hooks spaces can tell stories and unfold histories a spaces can be interrupted appropriated and transformed through artistic and literary practice but how is this done to do so i will take you to an artistic and literary world that will tell us stories and histories and that is agun pakhi so ladies and gentlemen let's go to agun pakhi now by hasan azul haq agun pakhi is a linear story told by as i said by an unnamed female protagonist by keeping the protagonist unnamed the writer has expanded her identity the identity just comes to be universal and this can fit any mother any person living in the margin who is multiply marginalized and she was born the the narrator of this novel is born in around uh 1900 and the story starts in uh, uh in 19 or 8 or 9 when she was 8 years or 9 uh, years and she was orphaned orphaned because of the death of her mother and she was also burdened with a brother who was 1 year or 2 years old and the brother was always with her and this becomes a metaphor for the rest of her life and she could never shake off this kind of burden in her life now this protagonist whom we are talking about the unnamed female protagonist is multiply mar- marginalized in the text in the social context she is marginalized in the patriarchal society in the in the in the parents house where her father was an educated person and he knew different languages but still he didn't find you know any reason to send the uh, send the girl to a school for learning because he he clearly tells what will the girls do after learning in school she will be a bit obstinate she will resort on the uh, she will she will retort on the face isn't that all does her space was narrowed down the domestic space was narrowed down then again she was geographically mar- marginalized because throughout her life she has hardly crossed that domestic boundary 
in 30 years of her marriage, she has never crossed the road across the village. And she has never come out to the village road on foot. The only space she could cover is the shuttling between the parents' house and the husband's house. And though she was thus sequestered, limited in her space, she could dissociate herself and she could reverse the center of decision. Again, in her husband's house, she was, you know, under the domination of the figure of the husband, the figure of the mother-in-law, who was widow and in absence of her husband, she was the guardian. Then this kind of marginal, marginalization of the protagonist continued for throughout the book. It, during uh, when she was uh, married off to a man double of her age, uh, she, she didn't have any voice. She didn't have a choice in, in selecting uh, the person and nobody asked. And it was said that whatever the guardians will do will be done. And in, 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 the, in, the, in the husband's house, she could feel that as a, bri as a bride, she came from a puddle to a big pond. But she instantly started feeling that she is reduced to a beast of burden. Because she said, quote, I started pulling the grinding tree that time and never could stop pulling that in the whole of my life. Despite all these marginalization, this time, uh, despite the fact that her space was sequestered, limited, she didn't stop. There was occasional, you know, uh, flourishing of her realization because she started questioning. She started questioning, am I a human being or the shadow of a human being? But still, she couldn't get the confidence to voice her position because, you know, when her ornaments were taken by the husband to buy some landed property, she had nothing to say. She didn't have any decision-making position in the family. But because of her sacrifices, she got occasional acknowledgement. When her ornaments are gone, the mother-in-law, the dominating mother-in-law acknowledges that yes, she has done a great service and the family members will remember her, respect her, obey her. This boosts her spirit. Then again, what the margin actually teaches us it will offer some opportunities and you are to grab it. So she, whenever the protagonist gets any opportunity, she, 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 she doesn't shy away from grabbing it. And here, you know, she was getting conscious about the family life, about life. And then at, at, at one night, that dominating husband tells her that she needs to learn to read and she says that, you know, the difference between light and darkness is the same, the difference between a literate person and illiterate person. Though with reluctance she started, she started learning and she completed her learning. And then she started reading a newspaper, Bongobashi. And, you know, she became conscious about the outside world, but still there is no, you know, outburst. We must remember everything is happening in that sequestered world, in the domestic world, in the margin. Uh, you know, for gaining her position, she started doing her service. She could understand that fate is there, but at the same time, you need to do your own work. So whenever there is any chance, she just jumped at it to carry it out. When her mother is when her mother-in-law was you know sick, she was the sole person to serve her. When her sister-in-law was caring, she is the most caring person, the closest person to help her in her days. 
And, you know, uh, because of our orientation uh, uh, to the daily newspaper of that time, uh, she was getting conscious uh, about the outside world, but still she couldn't get, you know, uh, the courage to uh, tell anything because one day that, bo that, that, that brother whom she brought up at the early age as a mother, he came for financial help and he couldn't tell the husband, though he was financially well off. Uh, this shakiness continued, but uh, you know, in, in, the, in, that in that domestic space, that limited space, she continued to realize that uh, uh, life is different once the youngest daughter of the, of the family, husband's family died, and she was the apple of eyes of everyone and everything shattered, everything just fell down, crumbled. And it was, uh, it showed that, you know, nothing will work properly, but she can see that everything was set. And she can understand from that domestic space that time tends to tolerate everything and can uh, the responsibility to all affairs be over, and it is not. So her life is a type of from puddle to the pond, to prison to the space. How is that? You know, uh, with the past of time, she started questioning about the irrationality of uh, uh, perdition because she, uh, uh, she, she was questioning the uh, position that if it is the religious identity, the difference, isn't there a difference among the Muslim, Muslims, among the Hindus? There are differences. So if those differences are incorporated, are tolerated, are solved, are settled, then why these differences are, you know, pushed forward to, you know, go for partition? She's questioning. And, you know, then again, uh, she was coming out once her son was arrested in Kolkata. And uh, she was, at that time, a later stage of life, uh, she was ordering the husband, almost ordering the husband. But it was still mild. I haven't got news of my son for long. Go tomorrow and have his news. And again, she was expanding herself in the fashion that when Priti Lata Waddhidhar committed suicide after you know, uh, attacking Pahartoli European Club in Chittagong, and she, she, she just came out as a universal mother. She said, quote, she's not anyone's daughter. She's the daughter of all the people of this country. She's the daughter of the whole world. Thus, she was expanding her uh, world. But the bigger questions she was pushing, looking at the political struggle in the bigger area of the country, uh, she was saying that, I quote, we get angry to see the fights between the dogs and cats. But in what respect human beings are better than the dogs and cats? All are equal if they find themselves lacking in one fundamental thing. And the fundamental thing is the stomach. And, you know, regarding perdition, she started questioning again and again. And uh, finally, she came out as a counter hegemonic power arising from the margin. Because when everybody of the family took the decision, they will migrate to the newly created country, the East Pakistan. Her son and daughters are already there. The husband has decided to sell the house and migrate to the new country. But she flatly denied because she was, she, her first question was, why should I go to Pakistan? Why should I leave my country? That my country, that positiveness is there. And then she was telling the husband, you are trying to convince me, but throughout your life, you have done a lot of things. It is not that you have done everything right. Rather, you have done a lot of wrong, but I couldn't voice. But today I am telling you that you are not right all the time. And finally, she defied everyone. She stayed back in her birthplace without migration. But she sat down to assess her decision. She asked herself, quote, have I done right? 
have I understood right? But she came to realize the fact that everybody is different. And she came to the conclusion that, quote, finally, it has come to my mind. I have done everything only to get myself. I have not been obstinate. I did not disregard anyone. I have only wanted to understand everything myself. So with this understanding, she came out as if we can get the voice of the rebel again, the ending point, well, uh, ending uh, part of Bidruhi by Kazinazul Islam. Ami Bidruhi Vrigu, Bhagavan Buke Eke Dei Padu Chinho, Ami Shrosta Shudan Shokta Phana Khyali Bidhir Bukho Koribo Bhinno, Ami Chiro Bidruhi Bil, Bisho Chalai Uthiya Chhi, Eka Chiro Unna I will translate that. But I can say that finally she came out like the figure. Ladies and gentlemen, if this quick and short discussion can add a bit to expand anyone's imagination and understanding of the margin regarding its empowering nature and nurturing, liberating spirit, my part, my lecture, my talk will be a grand success. Thank you so much for having patience. Thanks for bearing with me. Now I am open to questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot to Dr. Uh, Mohammed Sam Mondal. If anyone have any questions, please ask him and wait for answer. Anyone of the past participants? Yes. Uh, hello, sir, am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes, sir, you are right. So I must uh, uh, want to tell you, you uh, first of all, thank you a lot for this wonderful session. Sir, I cannot hear, perhaps. Yeah. Can you hear, sir? Am I audible? Uh, sounds noise, sir. No, can, uh, I can clearly hear you. Please, sir. Uh, yeah. sir. Uh, am I audible now, yes, sir? Yes, sir, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful session. Uh, what I would like to tell you is that not a question, but again, an uh, observation that uh, towards the last that uh, the housewife raises this voice idea that uh, I would uh, like to ask you that how much do you equate her with Shakespeare's Caliban? That Caliban says, I learned your language and I call you names. So, how much do you equate uh, Caliban? Oh, uh, thank you. It's a wonderful question, and you know. Uh, look, Caliban was also under a colonizer type of figure and dominating figure, of course, and it was the counter hegemonic discourse also was there. So I do feel that, yes, uh, well, there is parallel, of course, there. Uh, but can we, yes, uh, it's almost the same type of language because she learned the language from, uh, with inspiration from her husband and she was countering them. So yes. she was coming, coming up with that counter hegemonic uh, you know, uh, uh, language and stem. Uh, but uh, I, I do believe that it's better for us to, you know, set it in our context so that because Caliban's situation is in, in other location, it is our location. If we can, through the parallelism, we can, you know, uh, get to understand the spirit of our mother, the motherly figures of the, dem uh, of the domestic space, the power of domestic space, the power of the margin, it will be much better. Because the margin our mothers, our female figures are occupying are a bit different from the margin Caribbean occupied. Uh, but thank you that, yes, it is almost the same, but our mothers have different type of margin. Our female figures have different, different type of margin. And they are actually coming. They are having different type of uh, you know, voices, but somehow we are muting them. And for this reason, we cannot recognize. And my point was that we need to you know, recognize the voice because already the voice is there. Only the realization is there. Uh, am, am, I, am I clear, sir? Yes, thank you very much. And this, another observation is that uh, uh, when she is not uh, migrating to East Pakistan, right? Uh, and when the author is completely talking about the family, how much do you feel that this is, is, this is a kind of resistance 
uh, not to talk about the nation i mean transcending from the national discourses i want to talk about it's not only just uh, hitting back to the center but also a trans uh, transcend from the national discourses sir uh, i i have made a small point that you know that mother is emerging as a universal mother So yes, because she doesn't have any name. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not only that, you know, uh, when Pitalata was, uh, you know, uh, 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 Pitalata committed suicide. Yes, that's the point. Again, she was also thinking of those people who were killed by the, you know, Shodeshis, by the people of India, those people of England. She was also feeling for them, and she 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 came out as a mother of. that boys and girls who are being killed here in a faraway land the mother of those kids are feeling sad so you know hasan azizul haq's you know another purpose was to keep it unnamed uh, take that figure out of you know you know in a uh, uh, to defy that boundary so that she can be set in a universal you know as a universal figure you you are you have pointed you know uh, just you know very relevant uh, point Uh, thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you hello uh, i am yamin i have a question yes okay can you hear me uh, please i can uh, i actually uh, thank you for lecturing on nagun pakhi one of my favorite novels um my observation is as well uh, we prone to tag a certain say ritualistic show of patriotism like uh, standing up while our national anthem is getting played or uh, on all that but but, uh, but we see this female protagonist here in this novel is uh, doing nothing of that sort but for her the her bodu khoka now dead uh, or her home is the only site of love or existence so uh, do you consider her final decision to uh, uh, say stay back to her home and uh, choosing over her husband's will is her conscious attempt to counter the hegemonic discourses on uh, patriotism or it is uh, just she turned into someone like moria in riders to the sea Oh, uh, look, madam. Uh, uh, the, uh, in, in the final part, in the last phase of the book, it was very clear. Yeah. Uh, the, the statement of by the protagonist like that. Finally, it has come to my mind. I have done everything only to get to myself. मतलब बीस हजार साल ये उठी थी एका फिर उन्नत थी. Next one, I have not been obstinate. She's very cute. I have not been obstinate. and i did not disrespect disregard anyone i have only wanted to understand everything myself so it is a self realization and uh, uh without going for any analogy what i want to say is that her self realization has come to such point it is like bodhi prapti of gautam buddha and because of the completion of her uh, self realization she came to a decision that the partition especially the the arguments which were forwarded for partition cannot be accepted especially in terms of one identity while a lot of people hold the, you know a country was created for the muslims while you know a lot of people stays back in in the in that country which was divided so so her argument you know you can counter her argument but it is a strong argument but most importantly the coming out of a self which was cocooned earlier as yeah. a rebel as a person with complete realization that's the uh, interesting and that's the uh, that's the point which can be aligned to margin the margin as a site of resistance as a site of counter hegemonic power counter hegemonic language yeah yeah thank you thank you Okay. I have a question to Mr. Shahin Mondal. Yes, sir. I am Dr. Elham Hussain. I am Dr. Elham Hussain from Dhaka. Oh, I am yes, Dr. sir. I am Dr. Elham Hussain from Dhaka. Yes, sir. And at first, I like to thank you for this wonderful lecture. Uh, thank you, sir. I just have a question on the 
on theoretical basis. Please, sir, please. It's a very nice text. This is about, this is a subaltern study, I think, and uh, on partition. Some books are written, but this very particular section of people, especially the marginalized people, could not come to the canvas of our literature immensely. So in this regard, I think this Agum Paki is an exceptional text, a unique text. But my question is uh, regarding the resistance and regarding the market. Uh, we know that uh, you have told that the margin works as a register, but do you think that this marginalized subaltern can pull a potent resistance against a capitalist power structure? If not, then why? And we have come to know from Spivak that uh, she has also written uh, an essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, so far, I believe subaltern is speak, uh, but can they formulate a counter discourse against the discourse of capitalist power structure? Is it possible uh, for them? Yeah, 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 yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I perhaps got your question. The, the important thing is that uh, Bell Hooks is talking about two sets of marginality. One is imposed by the oppressive structure, another is the chosen site of resistance. As I said when I was talking about the theoretical part, that Bell Hooks is not interested about the people, about that site of margin, uh, uh, marginality or margin, where the people are prone to you know, giving up, prone to surrender, rather, she wants it to be a site of chosen, a chosen site of resistance. Once you are conscious of this position of marginality, then of course it can counter that capitalist, you know, hegemonic, uh, you know, structure, and it can come out. The question is, the capitalism is also extremely cunning in terms of they allow you voice. I eschewed that part uh, of the theoretical part. The capitalism, you know, allow you voice, but they cut the resistance from the voice. So the people on the margin, they feel that yes, they are, which, which actually uh, was, you know, whatever. Uh, the, the people in the margin uh, feel that yes, they have voice, so it's okay with them, but it is not okay with them. And it is the strategy of the capitalism. But when the people in the margin are conscious of the marginality, conscious of the opposing forces, and conscious of the potence and creativity of uh, marginality, and they can imagine this can create alternative worlds for them, and they can surely come out. Sir. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, sir. So, uh, um, may I have a question? May I? May I, may I? Uh, this is Gulam Mohyuddin from yes. Dhaka, Bangladesh. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, sir. Sir, please. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So, so far, I have understood, you know, the insights or the theoretical background has been borrowed from a scholar in America. So how can we contextualize this in our context or in, you know, in India or in Bangladesh? Uh, sir, perhaps you're talking about borrowing that insights from America and seeing it, am I? Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, it is, uh, it's a good question. Thanks for the question first. The second one is, unfortunately, uh, we are not, we have not proved capable of, you know, developing our own perspective into theoretical, you know, uh, uh, form so that we can analyze our own situation by applying our own theory. Our intellectuals, intelligentsia, our scholars, and we the people uh, have always, uh, almost all the time, except subaltern studies or some or group, 
we have always depended on the theories based on uh, 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 the you know studies of the people from other locations and the tragedy is that often we have tried to copy them imitate them cope with them and so we have seen a lot of fascinating philosophies and theories failing especially in the, in terms of marxism we can say so what is important it would be better if i could take someone from our context to explain the text but i'm sorry i am not getting that much a strong like bell hooks who can give me the insights to analyze the text from this point of view the second point is you know bell hooks has got all these experiences from her uh, black resistance in american context and she was uh, taking her in uh, you know uh, inspirations and insights from uh, foucault lefever and she was enriching herself with insights from around the people the marginalized people so i can feel that though she will not fit us 100% but she fits us a lot okay thank you very much hopefully we'll be having such sort of writers in future in our countries like bangladesh and india thank you sir thank you okay, okay. thank you very much hello uh, does anyone have any questions from the participants hello sir assalam alaikum Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Please, please go on. Tamim. Sir, uh, sir, can you? Uh, uh, I want to ask you, what kind of novel is this? Oh, it is generally considered as a masterpiece on partition of India. Uh, but my point is a bit different. But I think that uh, the the novel is actually based on a personality uh, which shows that a person can be a site, be a place, be a space which can give voice and consciousness. Okay, sir. Uh, you have you have given nice Thank you, thank you, Tamim. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Can I feel out the Dr. Samim? Now the uh, program is over. Please, Dr. Nag, uh, b- declare the session is over. Uh, I I thank uh, Dr. Samim Mondo, Mohammad Samim Mondo, for uh, delivering such an illuminating lecture. and all the audience for their active engagement uh, tomorrow we are going to have two distinguished speakers one uh, the first slot in the first slot we are going to have uh, onindo da onindo uh, i i know i know you know him because he is a renowned name in the literary field onindo puro kaisko and uh, in the second slot we are having uh, we are having to vet Uh, we are going to have some uh, uh, dr sarbani mukherji from asanshol tgb college so tomorrow we are going to have two distinguished guests among us and the day after tomorrow we are going to have three lectures and i will announce the names in the tomorrow uh, session so please stay with us there is a, there is some important announcement to be made tomorrow uh, till then goodbye 
give us leave and uh, mohammad samir mondol i i i i show my sincere gratitude for accepting our invitation thank you sir uh, goodbye till then goodbye thank you thank you so much welcome